The Tripp family first settled in Dorchester County here in the Eastern Shore in 1665. It was Henry Tripp. Juan Tripp was the eighth generation from him. In between Juan and Henry, there were two other trips of note. Uh, one was Charles, I believe, and he was uh, one of the creators of the steamboat. He worked with Robert Fulton, and he actually built the first steamboat to operate on Chesapeake Bay. So the seafaring part of the Tripp family carried on, and then of course Juan, with his nautical airline, Pan Am, uh, continued that tradition. Because I think what happened was that his dad was working in New York City uh, and took Juan to see an air show. And some guy was flying a biplane around a Statue of Liberty. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Juan was really attracted to that. And so when he went to Yale, I think he was uh, about the time the First World War was coming around. And so he decided to become a naval aviator. By the time he finished training, he had been designated a naval aviator. He was a commissioned ensign in the United States Navy. And so he went back to Yale. I think he formed a flying club and so forth. And then when he finished with Yale, he uh, uh, got involved with some flying operations. And he pulled together some of his friends from uh, Yale who were financiers, Wall Streeters, and uh, got some financing. Juan Tripp and a colleague by the name of uh, Hamilton. I can't remember his first name at the time, but I think it's George, but I, I, I might be wrong, uh, had gone down to Cuba and managed to obtain the traffic rights, formed as American Overseas, whatever the I can't, AOA, operating as Pan American Airways, one trip as the president. Uh, in 1935, Pan American had pretty much had the entire South America. And I won't tell you exactly how, but one of the things that was going on was that Juan Tripp was negotiating the traffic rights. The, he called them concessions in order for Pan Am to fly to different countries in South America. This was not a government to government uh, dealing as it is now. So he negotiated all the traffic rights and, and, and to the point where he was probably more uh, prestigious in these countries than the ambassador. <laughs> and a lot of and the story went that you could learn more what's going on at the Pan Am office than you could from the U.S. Embassy. And he also, with Igor Sikorsky and uh, Charles Lindbergh, was part of the development of these flying boats. And one airplane that was developed was called the Sikorsky S-42 and it was the most advanced aircraft in the world at the time. Once Pan Am had achieved the South America market, there was the next thing in Juan Tripp's eyes was crossing the ocean. What happened was that he needed to get concessions from the British. Mm -hmm. And there was, he was dealing directly with Imperial Airways, which was the predecessor of British Airways. As, as we know it today. <clears throat> but Imperial Airways was owned by the British government. And so the British government was actually representing Imperial Airways. And the Imperial Air British government said, well, why is Juan Tripp the owner of a private airline representing <laughs> the United States? Why is not the government? Well, that was the question that just left. Was the bottom line of this whole thing was, that the British did not have any aircraft that was capable or didn't meet the capabilities of the S-42 and did not want some American company parading that aircraft in front of its people. So they said, no way. Juan Tripp decided, well, if we can't do the Atlantic for the moment, uh, let's look at the yeah. So he sent uh, Charles Lindbergh and his wife did survey flights from San Francisco to the Far East using the Great Circle Route which you go up and you go over the coast by Siberia and Russia, except the Russians, the commie, uh, Soviet Union at the time, would not permit that type of route. So what ended up was that they would have to make the long, <laughs> cross the Pacific at the middle, which is the longest route mm -hmm. you can imagine. And the, now what's interesting is that there's a distance between San Francisco and Honolulu, or Hawaii, 
and that is considered the longest aircraft route in the world even today. Now you hear of airplanes flying nonstop from Newark to Singapore, but this route is without any alternative place to go. In other words, any, all these long routes you can you know, divert if you have to, but in this case there's nothing. And in the early days, the Coast Guard used to have a cutter stationed out in the middle of the Pacific, just in case something happened. Now the next uh, stop was from Hawaii to Midway Island, then Midway Island to Guam. Well, there's that Midway Island to Guam is a really long route, so they needed a stop. So Juan Tripp went to the New York Public Library <laughs> and did some research and found a place called Wake Island, which was a product of the Spanish-American War. It was an atoll. And he sent uh, his team over there to set up a, uh, well, not an airfield, because they were using flying boats. Yeah. So the China Clipper evolved out of that. And that was the first transoceanic uh, airline flight. Yeah. Went from uh, uh, San Francisco to Honolulu to Midway to Guam, up to Midway to Wake Island, Guam, and then finally Manila. And eventually went to Hong Kong. Then, uh, in 1939, the uh, transatlantic route started operating. And Pan Am was the only airline in the world that was able to carry passengers. The Brits and the French could only carry mail. So, and that was the scene at the, end of the, at the beginning of the Second World War. Just now, prior to the war, Pan Am was the only international airline in the United States. But because airlines like TWA and American and so forth contributed to the war effort, FDR basically said, Juan Trip can't have it all. And uh, Pan Am was the airline that brought the Beatles from London to New York for their uh, initial inauguration. And that was, it was a true example of product placement and how they pulled it off. You know, you would think BOAC, which was, would be the airline. But something happened in 1968, and it was this, the Boeing 747. What happened was that all of a sudden capacity tripled from 150 to 350. And you had to fill those seats. And bottom line is, is that there was a downward pressure on fares to get people to start flying. Juan Tripp, as I mentioned earlier, had this concept of building a big airplane that would uh, eventually be replaced by the supersonic aircraft. But that never came to be because Boeing canceled the project. Was, when this aircraft was introduced, we suffered a big recession in the early 70s, plus there was the, uh, the Arab boycott with the oil. Remember, I don't know if you remember the, the gas station lines. Pan Am was hit very hard because they had to buy fuel all over the world. And, uh, and this is, was the beginning of Pan Am's losses. He was a visionary. Uh, he, did his, he did things his own way. He often did things that uh, surprised his staff. But one thing he did have is that uh, the people that worked for him, why well, you could say they loved him. Because you go to a reunion and the loyalty to the company, for those that worked while he was, uh, is still intense. Uh, and that company's been dead for how long? 1991? 